Mickley Byerman. Did I get that right? You Again? are so good. Oh, I've you been practicing very good all day. I have to share as a result of our conversation last week in which I laughed uproariously just preparing for our record. Like I <laughs> haven't had that much fun in a pre recording meeting in a long time. Um, it, it, it's funny. In fact, uh, last week I got to hang out with you and laugh for, I don't know, an hour. One mm-hmm. of my coaching clients was telling me about their work in improv to do some healing. Amazing. And as a result, I just happened to go see two of my favorite improvisational comedians on the spur of the moment, Mr. Colin Mockery and Brad Sherwood of, uh, you, see who's like, yes, no course. kidding. I'm, I'm sitting in this meeting Thursday and we're talking about improv. I'm like, I need to, I think those guys were coming around at some point and no kidding. I pulled it up and they were in my town the next, the next night. It was meant to be. So let's see improv humor laughing with you and the the coup de gras here i am i don't often get an excuse to wear my favorite hawaiian golf shirt from I'm Bill Murray and Bur- thank you i mean this <laughs> i dress with intent dr dan what the heck are you doing with all this silly stuff you know i am i have the honor of interviewing a humor strategist indeed indeed what, what does that mean besides yeah, i, I get to say. laugh a lot when we talk <laughs> Exactly right. Well, and and I will be the first to admit that I I actually did make up this term because it makes so much sense to me. It's it's first of all, I love the juxtaposition of two things that don't sound like they should go together. Humor strategy, if you think about it, let's break it down. They do seem to be on opposite ends of a polar extreme, but in my opinion, they are actually fully designed to be integrated, and that's why I created this concept of humor strategy. Um, what how I look at humor strategy, it's it's the process of intentionally identifying and inviting creative ways to infuse humor and levity into your workplace culture. And what this does is it improves morale and engagement, both internally with your, your team and also externally with your audiences. So that's the term I came up with to kind of encapsulate it. Again, it's kind of the the inviting of levity and happiness into workplaces, but you have to intentionally find ways to do that. And I think I'm pretty good at doing that. And so that's why I've created this niche for myself. I think that's so important, the intentionality. Now, anybody that's that's heard me on this podcast before, in, in my area of logotherapy, we talk about humor being one of those core components of the human spirit, something that makes us so unique and is so important to our well-being and our health. And it just makes sense to me for you to say, mm-hmm. well, yeah, humor strategy. But I am curious because, you know, I, I enjoy I, I enjoy all kinds of forms of humor. And, and when I get around a, a group of good friends, I mean, I'm fortunate enough to have some funny friends, so much so that even their kids look at them, each one of us and say, Dad, why aren't you as funny as your friends are? <laughs> That's right. Thing, right? And, and so <laughs> and, and funny doesn't always equal appropriate in a, in a group of middle aged men. But how do you make that happen in the workplace? How do you keep it in, in a world that tends to be sometimes very PC or too PC? How do you keep mm-hmm. it appropriate and yet light and, and strategic? Well, there's a there's a lot of, of prongs here I think we need to cover. One is. Um, first of all, I don't think there's ever been a time in society when we've needed humor more. Um, we were talking last week about this. Obviously, we're coming, well, I guess we're still in a global pandemic. Um, we've all been forced to adapt our lifestyles in various ways, whether it's working from home or socially distancing or whatever it is. And so honestly, the intentional infusion of happiness into our world, I think is so important right now. And I honestly while I call myself a humor strategist, it really is almost happiness strategy because what I am asking for is not for people to become stand-up comics. You know, that's not the intention here whatsoever. And in fact, I have no improv training. I have no background in humor, you know, per se, educationally. I've been a humor writer for many, many years. And, um, but but the, the core of humor writing is just being honest and authentic and transparent and identifying things in your life that are real and honest and not trying to make one-liners out of everything. So I do think there's a difference between comedian humor 
and workplace humor. And I'm not asking people to go out and, you know, start dropping F-bombs if that's not appropriate for your culture or, you know, saying things that to get a laugh. That's not the goal here. Instead, it's to invite happiness, joy and levity into our workplaces in a very intentional way. So there is a difference between funny ha-ha and funny aha. And I think we need to be more funny aha, funny clever, funny witty and inviting that into our workplaces rather than trying to, you know, create environments where it's going to be a, you know, 10 minute improv session. Does that make sense? That makes so much sense. Absolutely. Um, it takes the pressure off trying to be funny. And, right. And, yeah. As you said, just inviting good times. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, I've been, so I've been a VP of strategy for a long time in an advertising agency. And after that, I was the CMO for a state agency and in all of my workplaces, um, I, I kept seeing over and over again, there is this sort of pervasive, um, I don't know, you have to be serious to be at work. Like we have to take our work seriously. And I think that that is absolutely true. We do take our work seriously, but I also think that we're not two different people. So weekend Mickley, who goes out and has fun and hangs out with her family and goes hiking and finds ways to enjoy my life is no different from Mickley who comes to work from eight to five, Monday through Friday. And so I don't think we should be bifurcating our lives into these two different things. I think we should be inviting people to bring their whole selves to the workplace. And that means being fun and being happy and inviting these you know, little moments of kind of just, just playfulness um, along with the really serious work that we're getting done. So I do think we can do both at the same time without sacrificing one for the other. And I do think that when we invite our whole selves to work, as opposed to the serious self who gets serious work done, then we have more opportunities to be clever and engaging and creative. And honestly, research supports this. I mean, there mm -hmm. have been studies, 27% more um, admired and motivated is the, the reaction to leaders, okay, who have a sense of humor. So 27% improvement in admiration from their, their uh, team and also, you know, respect, right? Oh. The, the teams who have a leader who's funny are twice as creative statistically. There's all kinds of, of statistics that back this up. And, and honestly, even you know from a marketing perspective, people who use humor in advertising can be from like 20 to 30% more, uh, make more money, 20 to 30% more money. So the, like it goes across the board, there's benefits all over the place for how, you know, this really does impact not only internal morale, but also your ROI, right? Mm -hmm. I guess my, one of my questions here, and you talk about the idea of, you know, especially leaders um, learning to be more inviting, more, more humorous. Mm -hmm. um, how do you teach that? Is that just born and you have to pull it out? Or are there ways you can teach an individual to... Uh, to be more humorous, to be more inviting, to to welcome those opportunities. Well, I think every one of us has a different uh, a different humor style. My humor mm. style tends to be sort of um, dry, maybe a little facetious or sarcastic. Yours might be, you know, slapstick. You like more comedies, and honestly, you know, that's why I don't think humor is the right way to go. It's more just that levity, right? Mm. So it's identifying opportunities. And so what I what I think you can do, again, you know, if you're just not a funny person, and we've all known people who just oh. cannot be funny, they just seem grumpy all the time, they just are very serious people, there are ways to get them to just look for the things. So like, if there's a leader who who exemplifies this, I've worked with some in my past, again, kind of grumpy, very serious, very bottom line oriented it's going to be um, either having that person identify someone on their team who can actually be sort of the joy coach for the team. Mm -hmm. So maybe the leader at the top isn't the person who's going to be the one finding these opportunities, but he or she can probably identify someone on their team who does have the sense of humor and, you know, make that appoint that person. Like you are the person who comes to a meeting with an idea as to how we can start um, in a fun and productive way, but kind of, take the team down a road that's a little bit unexpected. You know, um, when I was the CMO for uh, the Nevada agency I was talking about a while, about, a while ago, one of the things I would always do is start every meeting and I would do this well in advance and I'd appoint one person to either 
come to the meeting with a question or they would ask the question in advance of the meeting and everyone's ready for it. Mm -hmm. And it was always something really unusual. And that's what it's, we called it like our quirky question. So one of them was like, you know, who did you go to the prom with? And if you went to the prom and are you still in touch with that person today? And what do you think that says about you? Or like, if you had a walk-up song for an award, what would your walk-up song be and why? You know, these kinds of things that are just like something you don't think about when you're at work, mm -hmm. but it kind of makes you come to a meeting with either prepared to answer this question or, or you know, with the knowledge the question of what the question is mm -hmm. or knowing there's going to be a question that you have to kind of think about and, and you know, be prepared. And it just lets you have a depth of, of understanding of the people around you. Like the walk-up song, I think, has a lot of insight into who a person is and what they find interesting and fun and what they listen to on the weekends, that kind of a thing. So it's those kinds of opportunities, you know, just looking for those. And for teams, especially, I mean, ritual is a big part of our workplaces, right? So we all have Slack channels, for example, or something like mm, that. Right. So creating a certain Slack channel for, well, you know, on my team, it was water cooler chat, you know? So mm -hmm. basically if you're standing around a water cooler, what would you be talking about? So this is the place in Slack where you can go talk about, oh my God, what are you binging right now? I just finished whatever show it is, you know? Again, it's identifying those opportunities within the rituals at work and then creating opportunities for people to engage with those. So again, the leader, him or herself, doesn't necessarily have to be the ringleader, but at the same time, I think we do need the leader to recognize that there needs to be some moments of these, you know, levity and happiness within our work days that are, that are, part of our rituals and invited and welcome. And then that way the team feels like they have, you know, some leverage to be able to enjoy, you know, hanging out and talking and, and not feel like, oh, this isn't productive work time. You know, a leader needs to just see the value in the fact that there is some value in, in have, you know, having this levity and joy in, in the workplace and go from there. Right. Well, and I agree. I think any uh, research and retention or employee engagement mm -hmm. will show you that, um, the more interaction, the more connection between employees, um, the better the retention, the better engagement, the better productivity. And so it's not necessarily about one individual, but it sounds to me like you're saying it's it's all about the entire culture and the group and how they interact. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, and I did want to answer that really quick. Um, anybody that's known me since college knows that, of course, my walk off song would be uh, Glycerine by Bush. I didn't want to leave anybody in question <laughs> because I know they were thinking that and I wanted to make sure they knew it. And isn't everybody still in contact with the person they took to prom? I mean, that's been Ooh. kind of the, the the blessing and curse of Facebook. Right. This is a good point. And I think you're absolutely right. But I do think there's more to it. Like, what does it say about you? Because mm. even just going back to who I went to prom with now versus, you know, then versus who I am now, it's very enlightening. So, you know, oh, there's a little bit of a, there's a backstory for everyone, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that's taking the question a little bit deeper. What does it say about you? Well, I, what does in contact mean? I guess could be another thing too, that there's somewhere good, good point. <laughs> on a Facebook page, but Good so point. a culture of so humor strategy is really more about a culture of invitation and connection. Mm -hmm. And as we said, all the research indicating all those healthy connections for engagement and retention. How I, I, I really am genuinely curious. How did you ever come to humor strategy and, and how did you make this your your calling? That's a good question. Um, I think it really is, it arose very organically out of really bad situations happening in my life over and over mm -hmm. again. Um, I went through a really rough divorce um, many years ago. And as a result of that divorce, I started writing mm -hmm. and I wrote a blog that became pretty popular pretty fast. Um, and I honestly point to the popularity of it to the fact that I was so honest and transparent, but trying to find the humor in the everyday, you know, just looking for the opportunities to kind of, in a self-deprecating way perhaps, but also just a, boy, you can't make this stuff up, talking about life, right? So um, doing that, um, it, it really did kind of help me discover my inner voice and something I had been kind of squashing for a very long time. Sure. Um, and I think, you know, again, it's it's when when bad things happen, I think a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, 
it's what you do with it. And, and, you know, it's, you know, things were meant to be. And yes, can I say 15 years post divorce, I'm very grateful. And I am from the bottom of my heart, very grateful. I'm not grateful for how it happened, Mm -hmm. but I'm grateful for the fact that it did because I did find this Mm -hmm. intentional voice that came out and, um, you know, created sort of a fun following from it and a new career. Mm -hmm. So I started identifying at that point that even when bad stuff happens, because bad stuff happens to good people. And I think we all kind of grow up in this fairy tale expectation that the good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. When I found that, you know, it, and I hate to even admit it, but the whole idea that things happen for a reason kind of does make sense in a way. Mm -hmm. And it is what you do with it. right? Right. So being handed the gift, quote unquote, of a bad divorce and being able to write about my life post divorce opened up these opportunities. And that's when I started seeing the value of just approaching life, embracing what's happening, you know, and being honest and, and forthcoming and transparent about it. So honestly, it just evolved from there. Like I said, I've, you know, had various roles over my career, all in marketing leadership. And Mm -hmm. in all of my roles, I did bring this kind of sense of levity to the workplace looking for these opportunities. And then um, it was actually last year that I listened to a very great TED talk by Naomi Bagdonas and Jennifer Ocker, who wrote a book called Humor Seriously. And they make the case for humor in the workplace. And listening to this, it's exactly what I've been doing for all these years. And, um, you know, they bring up so many incredible statistics and sad, sad things that just made me go, gosh, we need to be talking more about this. Mm -hmm. One of the big points that they make in their TED talk is about the humor cliff. And it's very interesting to think about the fact, you know, if you think, I mean, you're a parent, right? Mm -hmm. Think back to when your kids were small and how many times they laughed in a day, Mm. like their lives are just joy incarnate, right? So Gallup conducted a poll And I think they talked to about like 1.4 million people in 166 different countries and asked them, did you laugh or smile yesterday? And the results were super alarming. And this is what they talk about in this TED talk. Um, At four years old, the average four-year-old laughs about 300 times per day. Wow. I mean, think about that, right? Mm -hmm. It's incredible. And then... The next question is, how long does it take your average 40-year-old to laugh 300 times? How many would you think, Dr. Dan? Let's give it a uh, give a guess. If a four-year-old, mm, oh, God, conservatively a week, maybe? Two and a half months. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's so sad. Isn't that awful? Why? I know. And honestly, if you if you put this against the context of our lives right now mm-hmm. with this pandemic and there's war and and there's the horrible economy, when I think about that, you know, humor cliff, I want to be helping people climb out of this cliff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they they talk also about the fact that, you know, obviously we laugh much more on the weekends than we do on weekdays. And again, sure. that goes back to this point of bifurcating our lives, right? This that, that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. And then They also talk about the fact that like you can you have a graph of when we stop, quote unquote, laughing in, you know, life. And it happens at about the age of 23. Okay, Mm. the number that the decline happens. I mean, huge drop at the age of 23. Okay, what else happens at the age of 23? That's about the age we enter the workforce. Right. Right. About the time we start sobering up from that 21st birthday. and Exactly right. Exactly. And I mean, it goes down and down and stays down. But the nice thing is it does come up at one point. But guess mm. how old, what the age is, where the humor cliff comes back up? Oh, I'd, I'd have to say it's post-work years, maybe pre-retirement, early retirement. No, my friend, it is 80 years no. old. At 80, no, we start climbing. stop it. And the stop. joke's on us because guess what our average <sighs> life expectancy is now? 76, thanks yeah. global pandemic, oh, right? Oh, goodness. So I really want to be part of the solution to like making us laugh before we die. I mean, (laughs) literally that makes so much sense. So (laughs) sad. And, you know, I hear you talking about that and I think, 
just inherently, just just naturally, I recommend that constantly in my office to uh, a lot of couples. What are you doing to stay connected? Why aren't you connected? What do you what do you spend your time doing on TV? And and many people that are disconnected are like, well, what are you talking about? We don't even sit near each other all week. Right. And so to get people to spend time, I mean, if we're going to be in front of a screen, it might as well be the same screen and it might as well be something that makes you laugh. Some of my most, you know, individuals that deal with depression, I recommend just put something funny on. Here are a bunch of choices absolutely. And, and it's hard. Yep. You're absolutely right. And there's a whole line of psychology called positive psychology mm -hmm. that, you know, has, has evolved in recent years. And I do, I mean, and again, another fabulous TED talk is Sean Aker, who does a whole talk about positive psychology. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Highly recommend his TED talk. Um, but it basically talks about how we have to wire, rewire our own brains toward positivity, Right. you know, and that's, that's really what like this, again, invitation of levity and humor into our workplaces, or as your point is, you know, really connecting with the person in a relationship, like we have to intentionally identify these things and make mm -hmm. time and space for them in our lives. Mm -hmm. And I think we just kind of forget sometimes we forget because it's convenient, you know, the person that we're in a relationship with, it's just convenient to just kind of be in the same space, but not together. Or when we go to work, it's convenient to just get your stuff done and keep your head down and do your things. But we really do need to be living a lot more. I mean, we hear it and it sounds trite, but, you know, living more intentionally. But mm -hmm. I think that means also trying to rewire that brain toward positivity. And there's all kinds of tips and tricks, you know, whether it's, <laughs> and this is the hardest one. And I am the worst, even, I, you know, called pot kettle, whatever it is, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a hypocrite here. You're not supposed to first thing in the morning, look at your cell phone. Like that's the worst thing you can do for your brain. Preach like, on. It, it really sets your brain up for destruction and devastation because it's all crap, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's all bad. So, um, and yet at the same time, I, I will share that just the other day, it was a Sunday morning and I'm on Facebook and I'm scrolling and there were, you know, this, this one post about these very real embarrassing things that happen to people and it's just people you know admitting these horrible things but they're so funny and I found myself laughing out loud like belly laughing mm -hmm. reading this list and I had a fabulous day you know yeah. and you do have to wonder if there's this correlation between reading something that just brings you joy and happiness and then mm -hmm. you end up you know having a good day as a result of it so I there are things we can do obviously and I, I know yeah. Yeah, they, they say don't look at the phone and I try, but dude, it's hard. <laughs> it, it is. They they call to us, especially if they're our alarm first thing in the morning. It's yep. the first thing we exactly. touch. And then, of course, it's just human nature. But I will repeat that. Many people have heard that way too much for me. But it is the single most destructive thing, habit you can cultivate because mm -hmm. it is crap. Even when you find humor, the, the times you find yeah. humor. But w w the research I read says you know, most of us go to our email and when we go to our email, we give the first best parts of our day right away to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Rather than doing something, building, get, getting some exercise, just taking the dogs for a walk, getting a cup of coffee, opening a humor book or something like that. It is important. Exactly. So, so maybe we exactly. look at a hybrid there. Maybe it doesn't have to be on the phone, but to have, uh, you know, I'll never, <laughs> it's, it's ironic you bring this up. I had an uncle many, many years ago when I was a young boy who had a collection, an entire basket of just silly little joke books. And I'll never forget as a young man, just <laughs> being so excited when we would go over to that aunt and uncle's house, just rummage through there and just mm -hmm. giggle at it. Yeah. That's really. Imagine bringing that basket of books to the workplace, you know, yeah. and starting a meeting by just letting people go through and pick one out and share their favorite joke. Like mm -hmm. that's exactly, you remember so fondly this basket of joke books. And I don't, see how that that shouldn't be part of our work lives too because right. guess what we're not you know d drones we don't sit there and and you know we're not robots we actually do need to have some laughter at the beginning of a meeting or if we're just stressed and you know we've been looking at the same email and we're trying to figure things out or crunch mm -hmm. some statistics or whatever like bringing just a little bit of happiness in is so important so i love that idea i do yeah I, I think you make a really good point you've said it a couple times that idea of this bifurcated lifestyle that we have to be different when we're at work and, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit um i often forget that because i'm so fortunate that well you know when i go to work you get what i get because that's who i am and that's what i do mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. there are so many other roles and duties in the world and, and jobs where you no know, people, ah, I almost said can't, they don't do that. They either choose right. not to. And we need people like you to come in and say, no, no, uh, you can have a culture, an inviting culture, a welcoming culture, a humorous culture mm -hmm. that cultivates connection and interaction and all these positive things we're all looking for. So we're not, oh, that's a horrible statistic. 400 times in two and a half months, it takes us to Two laugh. and a half months. Yeah. That oh, the average 40 year old. And, you know, honestly, going back to the idea of culture, what do we think of as like, the countries that are the happiest. Obviously, I, I, there's been so much research about this, but they're Scandinavian countries, right? They just yeah. do everything right, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Do you know that Scandinavian languages actually have one word that translates to happiness at work? Like really? one word that in their language that means happiness at work. We don't have that, you know? Like that to me speaks mm -hmm. to a culture that kind of embraces this idea that we should, that that should be an expectation. I guess the corollary to that, though, is that Japanese culture has a word that means death by overwork. So, and we don't have that either. So I guess we're kind of in the middle. I, yeah, we, we, we'll stay in the middle <laughs> of that one, but we need to start so. heading in the right direction. So yeah, that's, exactly right. I, I think that really is such a, a great point is, you know, you have to be able to bring your authentic self to work. And if you can't, it really does turn into this drudgery, this, this meaninglessness where, you know, for too many people, we start to seek stimulation or enjoyment outside of that. And that can be pretty darn unhealthy, too. So absolutely. And honestly, it's not that hard. I mean, one of the things when I give keynotes about this, one of the things I recommend is I call it the one, two, three, four effect. OK, mm -hmm. so this is honestly you want to try to bring more levity and joy into your workplace culture. This is one way to do it. One, the first one refers to make one reconnection every week. And what I'm asking you to do is to find somebody from your past who was important to you. You know, maybe it was a high school teacher who kind of set the stage for you to pursue something, or maybe someone who mentored you in your early career or a friend from a long, long time ago. You know, once a week, just reach out to someone. And it doesn't have to be by phone if you don't like that. It's email, it's just even messaging them on social media or whatever. So one reconnection. Mm -hmm. Again, what this does, it opens you up to new experiences, to new people. It reminds you of some joy that was in your past and it connects that to your present. So that reconnection is so important. The two, for one, two, three, and four, the two is two times a day, praise someone. And it can mm. be as simple as, Dan, I love that shirt. Fabulous shirt. That's something, right? Mm -hmm. Or it can be, you know, over the cubicle of the person next to you saying, oh my God, you really crushed that meeting today. Good job. I loved your mm -hmm. question, the way you oriented this. It was fabulous. You know, it's so important for us to identify the good things that people around us are doing. And mm -hmm. I mean, just think about even when I'm out at the store and someone says, gosh, I love your sweater. You know, like it just kind of infuses me with a little bit of giddy joy, right? You know, it's, it's funny to hear you bring that up. I, I just had to stop off at the store for a, a, a tortillas on the way home. And mm -hmm. It was so incredibly sad. It, it, th this couple was really needing to apparently get through. They were not in the best of moods. And, and the the young lady trying to get their groceries rung up was trying so hard to be positive and say hello and be kind. And just and unfortunately, they were not ready to have any of it. And so I made <laughs> sure I just just put on my biggest smile and said, you know, hi, how you doing? Thank you so yep. much. And just really, yep. I mean, I only needed a package of tortillas. It didn't take long, but you know, recognizing that, seeing that just in our day to day and, and trying Absolutely. to reach out and help other people can be not just helpful for them, but for us as well. So exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's exactly, it should be, you know, it can be personal, but it can also be public. So you yeah. pick, right. It yeah. could be just a one-on-one -on -one thing. Somebody, like I said, on your team, or it can be starting a meeting by saying, you guys would not believe the quarter we've had. And it's really led by the efforts of this one person. And, you know, we really need to, to, recognize that right now just taking those moments either personally or publicly to recognize someone is so important yeah. so those moments of praise looking for that two times a day i mean how easy is that right should be so really then, easy i know and the number three and the one two three four is it's again that how you start your day and there's a whole bunch of research to support this but you start your day writing down three things you're grateful for and i mean there are off the charts you know statistics about how that really does again, rewire your brain to be looking for positive things. So mm -hmm. if I know every single day, gosh darn it, I'm gonna have to open up my laptop and write down the three things. And even if I'm in a bad mood, if I'm waking up and I just don't wanna start this day, 
if I start thinking about the things I'm grateful for, mm -hmm. and the key here is to be very specific. So I'm not grateful for my child. I'm grateful for, because of course I'm grateful. Who's not, right? Of course, especially oh, first thing in the morning when they're stomping yeah. around, slamming doors, say, trying to get the shower, angry that their they're laundry teenagers. isn't dry yet. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Who can't but, find them to be the most lovable creatures at 6 a.m.? Right, 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 right. Exactly. On a Monday. So instead of just my child, you know, for mm -hmm. me, I've got, I've got older kids. I've got a 23 and a 21 year old, and I've also got a 10 year old and literally the other day, and I'm going to share this and I swear to God, she's going to kill me if she ever hears this podcast. So let's hope this doesn't go viral or anything um, <laughs> because she is in the bathroom and I, and she shouts and I kid you not, mom, my poop looks like a teddy bear. That is I wrote that down. Yeah, I loved it so much. That was my, yes. I'm grateful for, grateful for the fact that my, my daughter, my daughter's poop looked like a teddy bear yesterday mm -hmm. because it's just the most unexpected moment in my, in my life. I was, mm -hmm. you know, and I literally wrote it down and thought like, that really is just one of those things you never expect to hear. You never expect to no. hear those words come out of a person. No. So I loved it. So yeah, very specific things, write down three things. And then the fourth thing we can all do every single day is to just make four observations that are real and honest and that make us smile or laugh and to think about them intentionally. And again, it's not about comedian level humor. It's just about a shared experience, right? And when mm -hmm. we're at work, especially we have shared experiences. Mm -hmm. And so if you think something is funny or odd or quirky or weird, then chances are everyone on your team probably has the same kind of feeling. So looking for those moments, um, I'll share, I was giving a, a keynote a few, a few weeks ago, and it was very funny because I was in a resort and every single time I go to my room, I'd go into the elevator, push, you know, push the button on the outside, go into the elevator and then look to the panel to touch my number of my, of my floor, right? That's just what we do. This resort had no panel on the inside. So basically on the outside, you put your key card against the thing to, you know, to get the, the elevator to come. And then it knows what room you're going to. So it just sends you to that room, that floor. But it was so funny how every one of us, I watched it time and again, everyone get into the elevator, every one of us would go for that right hand panel, right? Yep. And so it was just like making that observation and then talking about, you know, in this keynote I gave, we talked about the fact that the resort is missing an opportunity. Again, for levity and humor, because mm. that little that little piece of real estate on the, on the elevator, there should be a sign there. It says made you look or, yeah. you know, something about you can thank the robot elevator for knowing exactly where you're going. No need to touch right. this panel, you know, something like that, you know, something that just, again, it's just an observation, but it was so mm -hmm. funny how, you know, talking about that and, and that was just something that just occurred to me as I'm there giving a speech, every single one of us had that shared experience. We are so, so conditioned just, for that behavior. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you can look for things that are just kind of quirky or weird or odd in your life and just share them with the world, you know, those four, four times a day, if we can do that, if we could just kind of look for that. And, and that also could just mean, you know, a GIF or something in your, in your Slack channel that kind of makes you laugh or whatever. I really, do, I, over time have become the person who's famous for in our Slack channels, always posting the really weird GIF. Like mm. I find the weird <laughs> ones not inappropriate weird, just like strange weird that somehow communicate what I'm trying to get across. So I, I think anyhow, there's it's great stuff joy, like that. And, and maybe it's just personalities like ours, but I find great joy in doing that. I remember when those were first coming around and you could, uh, you could quickly <laughs> access them from your phone. Um, we would, we would just have gift wars going back and forth. To absolutely. See goes, right, absolutely. And now yeah. today it really is more about, Oh no, no, it's not just about going back and forth. It's about finding the right one to communicate mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. try to get a, a chuckle out of whoever's on the other end. So that is, uh, as much as I bemoan modern technology, that is one of the great benefits we have is the old gift war. Exactly right. So let me let me recap. One, reconnect with somebody every week. Two, praise two people every day. Three, and, and anybody wants to argue this, like the research is prolific and, and stacks right. and stacks and stacks. Find, write down, not just find. Write down specifically three things you're grateful for every morning to start your day and four, four observations that give you a little smirk or chuckle. Like, uh, you know, when we're so conditioned to, to hit the elevator key and mm -hmm. it's not even there anymore. So mm -hmm. exactly. I 
love that that is those are those are great i hope anybody listening takes those with them and starts putting them away. i'm can can we make some people laugh here really quick because let's one of my it. favorite <laughs> things to let's put on a little comedy routine here one oh, of my boy. favorite things to complain about is bad therapy and and, and I take it very seriously because I feel as though I have to apologize for so many of my peers, um, some who are just kind heartedly trying to help and fail, and some who just may not be very good. I'm sorry, we can't all be good at this, and, and that's okay, but it really helps to realize it. And and you certainly have a story that you you wrote about in your blog. <laughs> I do. And I and do. I, I must have read it probably every day in the past week, just because it <laughs> infuriates me, but it makes me giggle uproariously as well. Yeah. Can you share, first of all, I have to apologize again for all of the bad therapists, all the bad coaches, all the, not even bad, just less than effective out there. But can you tell us about your experience, please? Absolutely. Um, and I have to preface this by saying that she's a delightful human, my therapist was. Um, I don't necessarily think she was really the best therapist for me, but at the time I just needed to talk weekly and get my anger and frustration and sadness out. And okay, so I gotta jump context... in. I, I, let me jump in really quick because yeah. you're right. And I want people to understand that it is about being the right therapist for you mm -hmm. at that time. And, and mm -hmm. if you have a relationship with somebody, even if they make, trust me, I make mistakes at least once every five minutes daily. Um, and that's okay. As long as we have that ability to have that relationship. But if you're out there and you have a therapist, if you have a coach, you're like, Ooh, mm, something, this, no, this isn't a good fit. That's okay. Professionally, we are wired to be able to say, Hey, that's okay not a good fit. Let me refer you to somebody that might be a better fit. So please don't spend too much time in bad therapy, bad coaching, <laughs> but to, to look, to be able to look at the other professional from across the couch or across the coffee table and say, Hey, I'm sorry, this ain't working. Exactly. And a good professional should be able to say, no problem. Let me find somebody that can be more helpful. Okay. And I do think we even get to the point where, where we might mature out of a therapist because Absolutely. they were good for us for a certain time. They, you know, we tackled some big obstacles together and now I want to move on to something else and maybe it's not in your wheelhouse. So that's always Absolutely. that too. Absolutely. However, so this therapist, um, she just was a delightful human. I very much enjoyed her. Um, I was with her for, I think, a good year and a half, two years or so. Mm -hmm. And this was after a particularly devastating, very awful time in my life with a very blindsiding breakup. Mm. Um, and so, you know, and, and it was really challenging. And honestly, like I said, I was basically there to cry for an hour a week. And it was my one time as a single parent to go and put the focus on me for a few minutes and, you know, not really have to worry about the rest of the world. So I went to her, like I said, for a good year and a half or so. And during this year and a half, I have to tell you, Dr. Dan, I learned more about this therapist than I think she learned about me. Oh, no. So there's we that. We call that self-disclosure, and it is a tool. And sometimes therapist self-disclosure goes a little too far. Again, for those of you listening, your therapist <laughs> should not use your time in there as their time to self-disclose too much. Yeah. And I think for <laughs> us, it started out, you know, very much like 50-50, and then it became like, you know, 30, 70 in terms of what I was sharing versus what she was sharing. I knew all these details about her life and her romantic life and her breakup with her ex-husband and oh, his no. whole name and her no. kids and all the things. No, stop. And you, by the time was, you knew your yeah. therapist, spouse. Okay. There's this great new tool that just came on the market in, in recent history for therapists that want to disclose too much. Okay. So again, any of you out there that feel you have a therapist who discloses too much, you can look at them and say, Dr. Dan says, start a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> if you Perfect. want to talk a bunch about yourself and your ideas, here's, here's a laptop and, and, and a really inexpensive headset. Go start a podcast. Don't use it. my hour for this. Exactly. An hour that you're usually paying for dearly. So yes, <laughs> there's that as well. So yeah, um, she did not start a podcast. Instead, she shared a lot of details with me. And that was all fine and good because honestly, like there's a part of me that kind of feels I could be a good therapist. So I kind of had fun with it. So I started doing the, you know, reflective listening. And so I hear you saying that and tell me more about this. And, you know, and honestly, like exercising my um, arm, armchair psychologist uh, muscles there, which was actually kind of fun. But we'll go to the, fast forward to the end here. Um, and we're in my session and we're at the end of a session. And again, lots of tears, lots of crying, puffy, swollen face, the whole works. 
And she says, Mickley, I want to ask you a question. She goes, do you think that you could date again? And I said, honestly, I don't know why, but I do. And I think that says something about me. And that's probably why I'm in therapy, because I should be less optimistic, but I am optimistic. And I, I do think I've had really, really, really horrible luck. And uh, yeah, there's a part of me that does want to date again. And she says, well, that's good to hear. Because I have a client who is a single dad. He's a lovely human. I think you guys would so hit it off. And I'm sitting here thinking, what? And kind of taken aback because I didn't think that was appropriate. But then let's uh, let's add insult to injury because then she says, and so I've taken the liberty of scheduling his appointment next. And literally as if on cue, the bell rings outside, right? And there's the bell that comes, you know, when, when the next patient is there. And I looked at her, I said, so you're saying the guy who just rang that bell is the guy you want me to date? And she's like, yes. I, she goes, I think you guys could just like meet in the waiting room and see if there's a spark there. And so you have to think about the fact that I am puffy, swollen, mascara streaming down my face. Like I've been in therapy for the hour talking about my horrible love life. And then she does this. So yeah, that was that. Um, walked out to the waiting room. There he was, nice enough looking, nice guy. He had his dog with him. I pet his dog. I made some euphemism about that. I don't remember. It was all such a blur. I just went super fast and like got out of there. And then I never went back. And the reason I never went back is because I couldn't handle, like, first of all, I'm too insecure to know, did he have a spark with me? What's the outcome? It was going to be so awkward. And so I just kind of left there going, well, that was a funny story. So it's not over though, because then <laughs> I ended up writing a book and um, I got an email from this man and I got quite a few just emails from people saying, hey, read your book, loved it. Thanks for the you know insights, whatever. And this guy just talked a little bit about, you know, just I'm a single dad, just reaching out to you to let you know I loved your book. And uh, and so I responded and said, thank you so much and gave him some insight about like a future book signing or something I was doing. And I said, maybe you can come and, you know, meet me there and we can, you know, mutually exchange stories about single parenthood. And he goes, well, actually, we've already met. And he said, I met you in the waiting room of our doctor's office. And so he did reach out to me. Um, and then I responded to him and said, wow, you really can't make this stuff up. And he had asked me out in this email. And so I said, you know what? There's a story here. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah. So I responded. I said, sure. When would you like to meet? And I never heard from him again. Oh. Mm. And Lack then, of closure is not pleasant. And then I felt ghosted. And that was yes. awful. Um, so I was actually telling this story just a few months ago to a friend of mine and I was kind of recalling this whole thing and just like laughing about it. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to look this guy up because of course now I had his first and last name because we'd mm -hmm. exchange emails. And so Dr. Dan, I Google him, I type his name into Google and it turns out he's dead. Oh, as you he said, you tragically, I know, I know. He tragically died in a car accident about six months after our email exchange. So he still ghosted me for what reason I don't know, but then he literally ghosted me because now he's dead. So there's that. I, and <laughs> I don't even know. I, for those of you not watching the YouTube video and just listening to the podcast, hopefully you cannot hear me writhing in agony and just yeah. trying to like... My mouth is about to explode with profanities, but this is a children's podcast, so I can't do it that. Is, but it is. Um, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I am so it's, sorry. You know what? And, again, again, it's the whole like you have to be grateful, right? Like, had yeah. I hmm. had I dated this guy, there's a chance he probably would have died in his car accident anyhow. Oh, so at least goodness. I don't have that going. What you a know? way to find the silver lining, right? And I that know. is, I mean, what a great example of uh, we often talk about finding meaning in suffering, turning uh, struggles <laughs> into achievement, but uh, that just doesn't seem to do it in this example here. I'm so mm. sorry. But that's okay, I, because honestly, it's just fodder for the blog and the future books, because my life has been a series of these really, you can't make this stuff up moments. Right. And I just keep documenting them for the world and sharing them. And honestly, that's the whole truth is stranger than fiction. It surely is. Like, sure is. 
you really cannot write this kind of stuff and make it believable. Like no one would believe this, but this mm -hmm. literally happened. And you know, no, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a crazy ride, but I think, you know, a lot of life is just about embracing the craziness and having fun with it Absolutely. and enjoying the journey. Now I do, I have one last question because I did find out a little, uh, something I didn't know about you prior to today, even despite our conversation last week. Anybody who listens to this podcast knows that I am a huge fan of the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the MBTI. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, for all of you that really care, I just achieved my master's certification last week. So I am neck <laughs> deep into the Myers-Briggs, right? And so as I was uh, trolling around the socials and checking out your uh, public CV, I think it was LinkedIn today, said, you said, um, fully disclosed, th throwing out your introvert flag there. Mm -hmm. All of this marketing work and, and human st humor strategy and culture work, what is it like for you as somebody who prefers introversion to be mm -hmm. out there sharing all this and, and, and writing all this and really encouraging people to, to live authentically and, and full of joy and humor? Well, honestly, my introversion is such a huge part of me and I'm thankful for the chance to tell the story because I don't think society has an accurate representation of what introverts are. I think society believes that all introverts equal wallflowers who are socially maladjusted. And yes, Ooh. I'm an introvert who loves to public speak. Mm -hmm. I love social events. The caveat is after I public speak or after mm -hmm. I do a social event, I'm curled up in the corner in the fetal position for a yep. good 24 to 48 hours and then yep. I'm good again. Yep. Um, and of course, I joke a little bit about that. That's not entirely true, but it should be because I prefer to be curled up in the fetal position, mm -hmm. though I don't always have a chance to. Yeah. Um, again, true introversion is we recharge alone. We get our energy from quiet and solitude sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really what defines me. Mm -hmm. And so I do love uh, to talk about introversion um, mm -hmm. because I think, you know, we, we need to be really accurately reflecting that as opposed to assuming that just because I say on some scales, I am as much as 93% introverted, you know, mm -hmm. and people say, you are such an oxymoron. How can an mm -hmm. introvert go and give public speeches? And mm -hmm. it, honestly, it has nothing to do with that. And I do value so much deep conversations Yep. I love deep connections. Like, you know, doing this podcast with you is a joy because I feel like I'm getting to know you. We're having mm -hmm. great conversations. I would rather do this nine times out of 10 versus going to a networking event where I just have to make small talk with people for, you know, <sighs> three hours. That's, that's my idea of hell. Yeah. This yeah. is much more engaging and fun and intimate. And that's mm -hmm. what an introvert I think thrives on. So a lot of my work recently, in addition to this humor strategy, is on really helping people to understand the true meaning of introversion and Absolutely. embrace and let their freak introvert flags fly if they want to, because more of us need to be talking about this. Absolutely. And just since that LinkedIn post, I had two people reach out to me, private message and say, I had no idea and thank you so much. You've helped me because now I see that I'm not alone. And I yes. think the more we talk about this, the better we're all going to be at identifying what real introversion is versus, you know, the societal norm. And I think we, you know, I'm sure you believe this too, but we're really living in an age of extroversion right now. Like it's the extrovert ideal. Everyone mm -hmm. should be mm -hmm. outgoing and, and saying their, you know, speaking mm -hmm. their truths constantly. And there is a place for the people who, you know, listen a lot more than they speak and process in their quiet moments, I wrote a, a the the post you're talking about. I was um was for a, a speaking event I did, and one of the tips I had in this was you know something called shower thoughts. Have mm -hmm. abundant shower thoughts, and that literally can happen in the shower, or the shower can be a metaphor. It's just mm -hmm. the private thoughts you know that you have during times when you're not at work when you're not expected to have these thoughts and that's when sometimes the best thoughts happen you know Absolutely. i really do feel like the shower or driving somewhere mm -hmm. or in my dentist chair are the places that i come up with the mm -hmm. best ideas so it often depends on how much ether or novocaine has been used what the Good quality point. of those thoughts Ooh. might be but they could be interesting oh but i was gonna say maybe more interesting ones with i know better... i thought i was being pretty wise one day and realized oh that was an awful lot of laughing gas Nah. <laughs>
<laughs> but to, to it your does point, change it a bit. It, just a little bit. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for clarifying that because I mean, your words are exactly what I've been communicating for a long time. Um, introverts can behave like extroverts. It just takes a little bit more energy. Extroverts can quiet down and actually be thoughtful mm -hmm. and introspective and pay attention. It just takes energy. We can flex to the other preference. It just takes energy. And I think Absolutely. you are a beautiful example of an introvert living their passion, sharing these ideas, but recognizing after you give a keynote out of an elevator where there are no keys and you can't figure exactly. out how to get in or out, that <laughs> exactly. you have to rest for two or three days. And rest does not mean hopping on an airplane and going and doing it again somewhere else really quickly, but it could mean a couple days of recovery and just sitting I'm not sure laying in the fetal position, just rocking back and forth is always great, but it may be necessary well, for some people. You know, when you've got three kids and you're also doing keynote yeah. speaking, the, the fetal position, you you get comfortable with it very fast. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's that's what weighted blankets were invented for, I think. Oh, so. good point. Good point. <laughs> Except I'm claustrophobic and those make me feel very claustrophobic. Okay, so I don't want to go there then. <laughs> I was going to say. And see how much better I am for this bit of therapy. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> You have been absolutely delightful. If people want to delight in your work even more, where can they find out more about you? Well, I have a website. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it's MickleyBierman.com. But mm -hmm. I also recognize that not a lot of people know how to spell that. Mm -hmm. And so as I do um, with my resume, my top line of my resume is my name is Mickley Byerman, which rhymes with prickly fireman because that just makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, people don't know how to say my name. So this is a thing. So anyhow, I also have procured the website pricklyfireman.com so you can go no, to pricklyfireman.com or you can go to micklebyerman.com if you're so inclined and know how to spell my name <laughs> that is marketing genius i love that and that's how i prided myself on learning your name before we even met last week so i did chant that to myself several times hoping i would get it right you have said i did so but you own the website pricklyfireman.com i do that's i do beautiful and I also honestly think that it is in my life to write a children's book about a prickly oh, fireman because yes. a children's book about a prickly fireman written by Mickley Byerman just seems like the right thing to do. Oh, there's going to be so much rhyming in that book. I can't wait to read it. I know, right? Mm, I'm looking forward awesome. to it. So a grumpy fireman has to cross my path at some point and then I can write about him <laughs> or her. Based on this conversation, I don't feel it'll take very long for that to happen. The universe will respond. I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. It has been absolutely wonderful. I can't wait to do it again sometime. Take care. It has been my pleasure, Dr. Dan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right,